a few seconds. <laughs> right. Ready to go. Okay, that, that sounds good. Let me just check. Okay. Um, Should I just start to No, let's just wait for a second, I think. That's, okay. That's okay. the idea. And um, so fine. that everyone is around. The, it, it, yeah. Right. All right. I think in the interest of time, it's, it's good to start. Yes. So today we have an amazing speaker. We have Peter Kiss, who is a PhD student at uh, the University of Warwick in, uh, with uh, Sayan Pata, uh, Charya. Charya. Yeah, Pata and, Charya. Oh, thanks. And uh, he has already written like some amazing papers, and he has won an ICAL Best Award uh, 2002 at Best paper award at ITCS. Recently, he has gotten a, a best paper award order this year. Um, and all of these are for his work in dynamic matchings. And uh, I guess today we are here to talk about a different topic, which is tracking and covering our piece also in the dynamic set. Um, and I think we are quite excited to hear and uh, yeah. From here. Thank you. So be talking about a sh common project with my supervisor Shayan Bhattacharya and boss uh, Simon Rock from University of Michigan. Um, this is a uh, this is not dynamic matching, but it is still dynamic. Um, but there are kind of big okay. I will this is in a uh, sorry. Just, uh, restart my phrase. And this paper will be also at Soda 23 uh, next year. Right. Okay. So. Just to clarify what the setting is here, we are considering positive linear programs, uh, either packing, covering, and in some cases we'll be focusing on mixed packing, covering, and we will be in the approximate regime. That is, we are expecting our solution to be epsilon approximate, either with respect to the constraints or with respect to the optimum value. This is the same uh, up till uh, rescaling. And as the title suggests, uh, okay, so sorry, a bit of uh, linear problems. We have a bunch of applications, approximation algorithms, flow, uh, graph algorithms, amongst others, uh, by programmable matching, uh, even for the weighted cases modeled by linear programs. Um, and if you're focusing on approximate solutions, uh, they are very efficient implementations for them, um, running in essentially optimal up until some polylog factors. Uh, what we are really focusing on is not just the LPs themselves, but what happens to these LPs as they are changes over time. And in contrast to the dynamic matching stuff you mentioned earlier, here we will be really considering partially uh, dynamic upgrade uh, updates. So by this, I mean elements of the constraint matrix will change in one specific direction, or the solution vector, or uh, the uh, actually. Uh, sorry, I'm just a bit uh, nervous about this. Right. So uh, we will be considering essentially two different cases. One which is relaxing and one which is restricting. And intuitively what this means is that in case of, say, a covering LP, as the constraint matrix has its elements increasing, the LP becomes sort of looser. So that's a relaxing LP. And it's restricting if its elements are becoming smaller. It's kind of tightening. Um, and the opposite changes describe a relaxing and packing, uh, sorry, relaxing and restricting packing LP. Uh, we will not be considering fully dynamic copies, but we will have something to say about those as well. Uh, all right, so just wait a second. Um, we will be mainly talking about what happens if uh, elements of the... I will mainly be talking about what happens if the elements of the constraint matrix change, but in the paper we describe analyze these methods if elements uh, of the input factors would be in the... Always in the opposite direction, but uh, the same kind of one that 
this would be happening to them. Um, and our goal really is to continuously maintain an absolute approximate just the, at the end of all of these updates. Uh, right. Uh, this problem in not exactly in this format, but specifically uh, when looking at applications of linear programming have been studied since the early 80s, but usually with a very limited number of variables. Uh, so two, three, like uh, say edges in a matching will create very small constraint with a few variables. Um, and there aren't that many, well, there aren't any general algorithms known for this uh, problem compared to, for this dynamic problem in specific, not for LPs in general, dynamic LPs compared to how dominant, uh, sorry, dynamic programs, algorithms are in problems which are modeled by LPs. So this really motivates our to generalize uh, those results for every positive LP. Uh, right. Um, specking and covering, there's nothing really better, well, as far as we have ever, there's nothing better known than periodic recomputation. Uh, and we will also see something about that. Right, so to be our contribution here is that we essentially optimally solve our polylog and epsilon factors, the problem of partially dynamic linear programs, and our solution is arguably quite simple. Um, so what I mean is that um, if a matrix has large and non-zero elements, which is usually the imperative we are focusing on, and undergoes some updates, then the total running time of our uh, algorithm is going to be about m plus t up until uh, epsilon. But our focus was not really on epsilon and polylog factors here because nothing was known prior. Uh, so this essentially puts the amortization uh, in the range for these two settings. Um, and this has some results, but and it has quite a lot of existing results up until polylog factors. The ones I've listed, I think, uh, results which uh, instantly follow. Uh, so uh, uh, decremental batching, which is weighted in polylog update time prior only solutions were uh, appeared in literature, or I think a single one. Um, there are some settings for fractional set card dominating. This result kind of uh, solves the gap for the incremental and decremental setting. But the general important is that for any dynamic uh, problem, which is modeled by a positive P, we essentially reduce it to Rounding problem, and there are quite a lot of dynamic rounding uh, on literature. So we hope that this is further applications. Um, on the lower band front, we show that what we do here in this very general set of positive LPs is optimal. Um, so what we mean by that is that if you would like to be fully dynamic in your updates, you would like to have worst case update time based on the based uh, it should not be possible. Uh, in fact, you can't quite do better than trivial. So this hardness will hold even if updates only happen to the constraint matrix, but it will also hold happen to uh, the input vectors. Um, and as periodic recomputation, not periodic recomputation, but recomputation after every update takes about time, this implies that these are uh, Nothing non-trivial can be done in this general setting. So you know that for specific LPs, uh, this uh, like a, say fractional bipartite I matching, this does not make sense. But for gen the general LP problem, it does. Kind of uh, somebody invent this problem, which generalizes it a lot of other, problems, but we can completely solve it with this fairly simple. That's our contribution. Um, so what we will do, uh, so I'm not going to get then to essentially the implementation. And what we do is we're building a multiplicative weight updates, which is very popular when it comes to efficient LP solvers, which are with independent. And 
we show an interesting duality between two kinds of algorithm uh, multiplicative weight update applications, which have already appeared in literature. And we essentially showed that these algorithms almost seamlessly extend to the dynamic model. But the analysis is instantly extending, and then there are some technical details which need to be worked out to make it dynamic. So the algorithm is actually once one has the multiplicative weight update framework, uh, the specific ones in mind is very, very simple. Um, so we will be working in the expert setting. Um, uh, this is uh, quite sort of standard and well known where our problem is. So this is sort of a meta problem we will be, uh, and we will apply it for LPs is that we got some N experts in T rounds, and our goal is to choose a distribution of experts at each round. And at the end of each round, the pay, nature will reveal us some payoff vector. And our goal is to maximize uh, our expected payoff um, over all rounds. Uh, and the very intuitive thing to do here is what multiplicative weight updates really do um, is that we choose experts really depending on, we modify the weight or probability of choosing an expert really just based on their performance in the previous round. So this is way, like this is very old in literature. Uh, I'm just kind of explaining the setting here. Um, initially, we choose each expert with the same probability. And after each round, we update the weights of each expert in kind of a straightforward way, just based on their payoff. And interestingly, this very simple algorithm is incredibly efficient and yields a ton of results. And in fact, if we were to run, um, run this for really some linear number of rounds with uh, respect to the experts, we have very tight solutions with respect to anything to any fixed expert in advance. So what this theorem says um, is really that the, any fixed expert over um, uh, some rank will be kind of an epsilon factor, um, log n over epsilon factor, sorry, an epsilon multiplicative factor and over epsilon additive factor of from multiplicative weight update idea. Will be abusing or uh, exploiting throughout the whole of this algorithm. This is an incredibly strong thing that plenty of applications, not just in linear. Um, and now, try two different ways how you can solve programs with with this standard frame. Uh, we don't claim novelty for these uh, methods implicitly. I mean, implicitly, the other one uh, explicitly appeared before, but we show a kind of nice duality between them. And we essentially show that they're really sent to the dynamic model. I'm too quick. I'm not a very experienced person. Right. So the algorithm we're going to present is what we call a whack-a-mole algorithm. Um, and in geometric set cover papers, this have implicitly appeared uh, prior. Not, we're not creating novelty on this, but we haven't seen it written down like this. And the idea is that variables of the LP will correspond to experts. And okay, so first of all, we will normalize the LP such that the optimum solution has value around one. So therefore, for now, just assume that opt is one. And then essentially a solution to the LP corresponds to a distribution over the variables, and our variables will be our experts. And in this context, what's going to be a mole? Uh, a mole is going to be an unsatisfied, which we want to satisfy. We want to. Uh, and each round of the multiplicative weight, uh, we choose an unsatisfied constraint. And by unsatisfied, we mean that it's off more than some epsilon factor. Um, and we essentially pay of vector, which really just corresponds to the row of the constraint matrix. What this does is that it pushes the variables in a direction which is more, uh, which is close for this very specific uh, line of the constraint matrix. This is really as simple as 
as it gets. If there are no moles left, we, in some round we reach a stage where no unsatisfied constraint, that we obviously have a solution. And since we assumed optis, uh, and our solution is always uh, always a distribution of the variable, this will be some epsilon approximate solution. Uh, so we are very happy. Another option that we keep doing this process of uh, in fact, for some London times log n over epsilon square, apologies, I did not, it was written, but I was, did not say that loud loud for the maximum value of the, in the constraint matrix, um, after normalization. Um, so if it, this value, which is essentially linear in lambda, uh, in terms, then we will be able to argue that, interestingly enough, we can construct a dual solution. Yeah, and the dual solution is constructed defined here that essentially is just going to be the average of the indicator of the constraints we wept. So over these t rounds, yt is just going to be one uh, at the constraint we wept in the t uh, teeth round. And um, Zero elsewhere. So it's really just saying which constraint did we whack on average. We'll be able to argue if uh, is this nice will pop out from multiplicative weight updates in a trivial manner. That at the end of this process, either x the epsilon approximate solution to the covering LP we started, or y t is an almost absolute solution to its backing dual. Um, right. So I'm, I'm going to get here technical, but it's actually not particularly complicated it's for multiplicative weight updates, uh, why this holds. Um, so if XD is returned, we only return XD if there's a round when there's no unsatisfied constraint. So in that case, uh, um, so we know, okay, that's a good question. Um, so Goran Zuzik asked if uh, Webson approximate uh, additively or multiplicatively. In since we have we have normalized uh, to one, I think whatever we get here will translate into the worst of the two because because of the normalization. So additive solutions and approximate solutions for LP is depending on. I might be wrong here. I don't want to say something stupid, but I think it's always the worst of the two. But more is explained uh, on this issue in the paper. Um, what we are for, if we normalize it is one, but for this to be an actual solution, so yeah, so it is the same once we normalize, but once you renormalize, it grows out to be multiplicative. Um, anyways. Um, so right, if we return xd, then there's no unsatisfied constraint. So that part of the theorem is straightforward. What is a bit more difficult to argue is that this process cannot be running forever, essentially. Um, and then just recall the experts meta theorem we had, which looks a bit messy. It's actually not as, as friendly as it looks. And note that in this context, uh, elements of the constraint matrix are in zero lambda. And we and the payoff vector we define is always the row of the constraint matrix matrix over lambda, which means that payoffs are going to be zero one. Therefore, that absolute value there can be simplified uh, like this. So we will continue on with this equation, and we will and this will hold for all experts uh, by the multiplicative weight of the theorem. And the we'll first focus. Okay, we'll first rearrange it a bit and focus on this rearranged right side. Uh, so this is just the right-hand side uh, taken out. And uh, we now observe that we always whack a violated constraint, which kind of means that all of these uh, payoff vectors times xt, they always have to be uh, at most one. So the le left sum here can be just uh, simplified over to one over lambda, because we are summing from one to t, t over lambda. Right. And then, because we set t to be lambda, uh, log n times lambda over epsilon square, 
uh, we get this one plus epsilon over lambda as an overall sum for the right hand side. I hope not going too quick, but these are really just simple substitutions using the property that we always work. Maybe a, a brief uh, clarification question. So are you normalizing the payoff vector by one over lambda? Is that correct? Right. Yes, yes, that is like correct. How, so if you, how is PT exactly defined? It is the column. Sorry. Uh, uh, so P, let me just go back to that part of the algorithm. So it's the P, right? Yeah. So it's essentially just the violated row over. Okay. So here in the uh, fourth point of this thing, the jth element of PT is just. So CIT, J, CIT, T thrand of C is the which 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 was violated in the tate uh, term which we choose and we are just dividing that by lambda why all the payoffs are going to be in zero one we are normalizing by lambda sorry if that wasn't clear right let's go back here right so right hand side um uh, sorry where was i yeah right so this sum here just bec uh, so this sum essentially just becomes t over lambda t falls out you get one over lambda and then the whole expression just simplifies on the right simply because of the choice of t right so it remains so we got something very nice on the right which i didn't substitute here properly uh yeah okay so we, if we substitute what we got on the right uh, what we got for the right hand side as an upper band we get this and then now we have to argue or have to have to somehow connect uh, the dual solution to what's on the left hand side because we want to argue that y is going to be an appropriate dual solution. Uh, so let's focus on the left hand side. And this actually, if you open this up, and I'm, I'm going to go through and try to make this a bit more detailed, what's on the left hand side is really just the average payoff of a fixed expert by definition. Uh, this is how the whole thing is uh, essentially set up. And what this will essentially give us is that, uh, well, uh, right, so th these are really just substitutions. The left-hand side represents the average payoff of uh, of one of the of a fixed expert and we substitute back into the band then it's going to be upper banded by simply one so it's oh i'm really struggling to give a good intuition here but essentially it's set up to work this way with the average payoff but the point here okay yeah oh, i'm being unclear here sorry um and this essentially concludes the proof because uh, the last line implies that at this point we are some uh, over epsilon factor of one for every column uh, of the constraint matrix when multiplied by y. So this is not a new, very new application, but it's kind of cleanly put together and we haven't seen this appear in literature. Um, now, this in itself doesn't really tell us how to do this efficiently in near linear time. And that is because there will be some lambda iterations of this, so lambda times log n over epsilon square iterations of multiplicative weight updates. Uh, and lambda could be quite large. So we need to be independent of lambda here. We want to be kind, kind of small. Um, we want to be near linear in the number, a number of non-zeros. So let R of I stand for the number of non-zeros in the I throw. And observe that when we vec a constraint or complete a random the multiplicative weight update, we will uh, do some uh, we will do some R of I multiplications because we will be changing the values of some R of I values. So we will also be normalizing at the end of each round. But we can keep uh, approximately track of, we can approximately normalize and get rid of that as an issue. But essentially, we are spending a bad RFI time with each VEC. But furthermore, we can sometimes VEC a multiple number of times because we, we 
don't have to just vec a single time. We can vec a constraint until it becomes uh, sort of satisfied. We actually did not exploit that c of x uh, i is less or equal than 1 minus epsilon. We only exploited in that proof that uh, c times x t i is less than or equal than 1. Uh, and this epsilon gap will be useful for the further analysis, but this actually means that in a, with, we can repeatedly fact the same constraint in most of the time, and this is what's going to give us the independence of lambda. Uh, but what we will, what we will, what we can make sure of is that this const uh, unsatisfied constraint, uh, after one of these series of wreckings, which we will call enforcing the constraint instead of wrecking, like this batch of enforcements will be called uh, enforcements in the rest, is ensuring that that constraint changes its. Uh, output by a multiplicative epsilon factor. And we will argue that this should not happen too often, essentially. Um, so the way we will argue that is through arguing a general upper band on the sum uh, of all weights uh, within our solution. Uh, or sorry, this, this is a bit off because that wants to be x hat, not xt. So that is the unnormalized weight. Apologies, that's a typo. Um, and this is actually something which, again, really follows from definitions. Everything is set up in a way that in a single round, the sum of the weights will only change by some epsilon over lambda. The epsilon is coming from the epsilon multiplication, the multiplicative weight framework adds, and the over lambda is coming from our normalization. And as there will be some lambda times, uh, all right, uh, Furthermore, whenever we uh, whack, we will always be sure that the constraint is uh, unsatisfied. Um, so this uh, C x hat t term is also at most one. That's an important detail here. Um, and as we will be whacking at most some lambda times log n over epsilon squared times, this lambda will fall out, and then we get some n to the one over epsilon factor. Uh, for the sum of the weights overall. Right, uh, this might have been a bit, sorry for the typo. But this will be essentially our core observation that the sum of the weights does not grow to be stupidly exponential. And because as I said, when we not whack a constraint, but enforce it, when we repeatedly whack it, that constraint has to significantly increase in volume. We can argue that this can't happen too much just based on uh, this upper weight band. So when constraint i, uh, sorry, I say whacked here, but I wanted to say enforced, its value will increase by a multiplicative epsilon. Uh, this implies that at least one of the uh, weights have to increase by one plus epsilon factor. And if just that weight would keep increasing more than some polylog times, that would already violate the sum of the weight requirements of uh, that the sum of the weights is upper banded. And this essentially, yeah, this can only happen a small number of times. Uh, and this means that each constraint is whacked a small number of times. And the constraint whacking takes time proportional to the number of non-zeros in that specific row. So overall, the amount of work we do should be proportional uh, to the amount of non-zeros in the whole of the matrix, because we're summing by the rows. Right, that might not have been very clear, but the essentially the key point here is that we can make sure that somehow each constraint is not enforced too many times that's the main uh, main goal here and this instantly gives us a very efficient static implementation are you here suppressing an eps one over epsilon and it can only happen one over epsilon times or is this oh really yes yes so i'm here i'm getting to our work is not focusing on polylog uh, and over epsilon factors so here, everything, all of these factors are uh, ignored. Uh, our work is, at the end, is going to be going to have like a, a cubic epsilon dependency, which is uh, fairly suboptimal. I'm um, just wondering because you're upper bounding the L1 norm by by n to the one. Oh, the I see. Right, right. There's that should be. I agree. Sorry, apologies. That should be one over epsilon square up there. I think. Yes, you're right. But yeah. We we're very hand wavy here because that's not our focus. But thank you for pointing it out. And then 
Okay, so what I really told you is that if we fixed opt and we ran this algorithm, I showed you, well, I tried to show you how to get either a good primal solution or a good dual solution. But for that, we had to fix opt. The, we can relax this by introducing just one log n over epsilon factor uh, through guessing opt within some one plus epsilon factor. So we will have log n over epsilon parallel runs of this algorithm. Some of, like, up, uh, some of them will be returning a valid primal solution. Some of them will be returning a valid dual solution. And there will be a tightest primal and a tightest dual. And that will be guaranteed to be epsilon approximate, both of those will be guaranteed to be epsilon approximate. And then you just need to rescale that, that specific iteration to, uh, to get an unscaled solution. This does introduce, of course, another epsilon factor. This is also something we suspect we can get rid of, but it was not really our focus here. The interesting thing really here is that is, is the parallel dual and primal uh, we are calculating uh, in the same algorithm. Now, uh, the whole talk is about dynamic algorithms, so I'm going to very essentially, if we can be very hand wavy about dynamization, because what will turn out to be the case is that everything almost instantly, instantly happens to be dynamic. Uh, and initial is if we want this algorithm to be running dynamically, and in this setting, uh, I'm talking about restricting updates to the covering LP, so the elements of the covering matrix are decreasing. Uh, at the initialization, we just run the static algorithm. Uh, if it returns a valid dual solution, that dual solution is going to remain valid because the dual relaxing packing LP is going to be relaxing. So any solution remains a valid solution. Um, and if it returns a primal solu uh, a primary solution X, which is not valid, uh, uh, which is not valid, then we can wait some for some updates. Uh, excuse me, sorry. If it re if it returns a valid primal solution, then we can wait for updates to occur. And as long as some updates don't happen to occur, that should also remain valid. And as new updates will occur, some constraints will just become uh, violated, and we straight up enforce them. Uh, that's what we really do. And it is kind of uh not surprising that it this works because in all of this previous uh, algorithmic description I was making, I did not really care about the order of the constraints or where they happen to be. And everything is actually fairly independent of uh, number of constraints and in which order do I enforce them in. So if you just consider a restriction, a restricting update to just be like the arrival of a new tighter constraint, everything should just continue running for that new tighter constraint as well. And this is what really happens. Uh, all of the analysis doesn't really care about whether this new, this constraint we are again enforcing is something which tightened or it was there at the beginning. It was just strictly harder than another constraint, uh, if this makes sense. But really everything is completely seamless in terms of the correctness analysis for the straight up substitution. Uh, Right. You have to believe me on this one, but it is really uh, a one-liner if you follow through the proof. Um, now, there are some difficulties with the dynamic implementation, which are not instantaneous. Um, namely, that when we enforce a constraint, we change the uh, whole variable vector. And this update uh, might change a lot of other constraints to be unsatisfied. Uh, or heavily violated, like by more than an epsilon factor, and we don't really have time to uh, check all of these. That that would put our complexity to be something like n times m, and we don't want that. And the solution really um, is just to keep approximate track of each variable. And because, okay, let me just get one more line. So every constraint weight will be monotonically increasing, and as argued, the sum of the weights is upper bounded by some polynomial in n. And if we just keep an epsilon approximate track of any weight, we should not be updating more than a small number of time per, uh, per variable. And once a variable is indeed updated, then we can check every constraint it appears in, whether they became violated due to this update or not. 
And this would mean that we are having a time complexity which is summed column-wise instead of row-wise, but it's additive, not multiplicative. So we still remain efficient. So essentially, this is kind of standard. We are just keeping approximate track of what we need to uh, enforce. It makes things more technical, but it actually works out to quite simple, to be quite simple. Do note that some of the analysis, which I was very hand wavy, becomes messier when you introduce dynamically changing constraint matrices. But uh, if you're interested in that, it's well explained in the paper. But none of those will be a stunning surprise, I would say. Right. Um, so what this result is that we will be able to maintain an approximate solution to restricting covering LP and to its relaxing uh, packing dual LP. Um, obviously, you could ask the question about the opposite. Uh, what could you do with a restricting packing LP and the relaxing covering LP? And this framework doesn't seem to extend, or at least that's our impression. So in a case of a restricting packing LP, variable weights will be decreasing and not increasing over time. And we will be able to lower bound the sum of the variable weights. But this will not provide a lower bound on individual variable weights. And we will not be able to bound how many times specific constraints are enforced. In fact, you can draw up examples where there is a constraint which is enforced like n times and has lots of variables in it, even though the variable matrix is quite sparse. Uh, and it results in a running time, which is n times n, which is suboptimal. So something else needed is needed to solve this. Uh, actually, quite a lot of technical work. And for this, we will be dynamizing a different kind of multiplicative weight update algorithm, which turns out to be the exact dual of this solution, but will allow us to do sort of more radical steps in each update step. And this will allow us uh, to resolve this slight inefficiency. Um, and this way, we will get restricting packing LPs, relaxing covering LPs, and relaxing mixed packing covering LPs. Um, and, and we can also maintain a dual for uh, relaxing mixed packing covering LPs, but the dual of mixed LPs is not a mixed LP, unfortunately. We don't know how to do restricting mixed LPs. There, right. Um, so again, consider a covering LP, but now it's going to be relaxing instead of restricting. Uh, and the constraints are just going to be the variables. Uh, sorry, uh, the constraints instead of the variables. So we will have m ex uh, experts instead of n experts. Variable uh, experts not correspond to the rows. Um, and our initial solution is zero, and our initial distribution is uniform over the experts, that is the constraints. And in each round of the multiplicative weight update framework, we will be looking for a cheap coordinate. And what is a cheap coordinate? Whose uh, weighted cost with the expert weights uh, is small. And this is precisely if we were to be applying the whack-a-mole in the dual. And that cheap coordinate, uh, you can always show that if the app is feasible, uh, such a coordinate should exist. Uh, and that cheap coordinate we will extend by a little bit, uh, by, say, some epsilon over log n, or it will depend on the elements of the constraint matrix, but by some small amount. And uh, we update the weights of the constraints exactly the same way as we did in the Weckermol algorithm. We are really just looking at it from like the uh, rows perspective now. But it's exactly the same update rule uh, as in Weckermol. And you can, uh, uh, right, yeah, the same analysis will extend. We are really not doing anything different, but quite a lot of papers appeared with this implementation and multiplicative weight update not realizing this duality. And they have very different analysis ideas. Some of them are very messy. So it's interesting to see that this pops out just from the multiplicative weight update framework. And in this model, uh, either XT, if we run, run the algorithm for long enough, and we keep increasing the primal covering solution, either it at some point becomes valid, or if we can't reach that point, then the dual solution, uh, which is a packing solution, is which is just going to be the constraint weights, uh, the normalized constraint weights will be a dual solution, is going to be a valid dual solution. And we can have 
an opposite application of the remote applicative weight update theorem, where we are running it on XT values uh, instead of YT values, and it flawlessly works out. Um, the dynamic implementation is a bit different, and that difference is required in order to resolve us that slight inefficiency I mentioned prior, uh, which we had with the constant weights moving in the wrong direction. Um, and the analysis we present in the paper is a lot messier, and it relies on mainly quant work uh, with a very for, on a very nice source of paper uh, by Kant uh, from 2020, and it really relies on keeping track of a soft uh, max of the covering weights. And it's a slightly different, less clear argument. It's less clear to see why it's multiplicative weight update. Um, but similarly as prior, if we want to make it dynamic, we run the static algorithm and we look for cheap coordinates as long as we can find cheap coordinates. If we run out of cheap coordinates before the solution becomes valid, we claim that we have a valid dual solution. And if we receive enough updates such that we find a valid primal solution, that primal solution is going to remain valid because in this setting, the updates are relaxing. Um, and this is really what we do. And similarly as to the other setting, we are running uh, different guesses for opt in parallel to make this work. Um, right, so an increment of the of a cheap coordinate is really the same as a constraint informants in the dual. But the way we increment it is a slightly different because we will be focusing on how much the least uh, the least movement the set of non-satisfied constraints will be making. So we will increase a coordinate uh, by some small amount, and we will be focusing on uh, the set of unsatisfied constraints and the smaller, uh, largest movement. Uh, amongst these, and we will make sure that it's at most epsilon over log n. And turns out if you make sure of this, then things will be moving in the right direction. There's quite a lot of math, quite not very heavy, but messy calculations involved with this. Um, but due to this different argument on the, way, uh, on the incremental step, we don't run into the same issue as with uh, the decreasing weights uh, on the whack uh, algorithm. Right. I really, I really recommend you to read the paper on uh, the details in the paper on this, but these are fairly technical works in regards with dynamization. In the statics, I think you don't run into these issues. Essentially, we can make more aggressive steps. That's what really is going to happen. Right, sorry, I, I'm being a bit quick because I'm uh, running out of time. But, well, not really, but I'm trying to be efficient. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so as I okay, so this really concluded all I had to say on the algorithm front. I will say a bit about what what byproducts of these results instantly have. But first, I would like to say a few words about how we achieve our lower bounds. Um, so we can here handle partially dynamic updates with almost optimal amortized update time uh, to positive LPs, and it would be interesting to see. Uh, what can we do with whether we can do worst case update time or what, what would be even more interesting, it would be fully dynamic updates. And it turns out that we can't. Uh, and the answer to them is no in kind of the straightforward way that there's nothing, for those questions, there's nothing more you can do than the trivial. And for this, we use a specific formulation uh, of the strong exponential time hypothesis, um, where our goal really is that we have two set of vectors, and we would like to verify um, essentially whether it is the case that in one set of the vectors uh, there is one which is greater than uh, another. So we have some smaller, we have some vectors with, uh, with probably smaller uh, elements in it, and we have a set of vectors with larger elements in it, and we want to want to really detect whether the smaller set has a vector which is strictly larger, or not strictly larger, but greater or equal in every coordinate than one of the vectors from the larger vector set. Um, and under set, this is a difficult problem. And essentially, we can simulate uh, this calculation with changing LPs. And uh, I don't, like the setup is quite straightforward. Uh, 
uh, if you read the details, there's quite a lot of because of the numerical calculations which need to be set up will be messy uh, just to get this set based, uh, just to get this version of the set uh, hypothesis. But essentially what we will set up is we're going to set up an LP where if we pick specific constraint rows uh, to be zero and specific ones to be one, that we really define whether a specific vector of the larger set is smaller than any of the vectors uh, in the smaller set. So we just design kind of this per special purpose LP, which can essentially take one vector as an input, and it can verify if the A vector ha set has any vector which is strictly, in, in all of its coordinates, greater than or equal than this vector. And this take as an input can be uh, just simulated with element updates um, in one direction. So it's always going to be, since this is uh, a packing LP, those element updates are always going to be redu reducing updates. And if we allow ourselves to be fully dynamic, then we can just revert to the initial state. And this, this way, we can use a fully dynamic LP solver to really verify this problem. Sorry, I'm not explaining this too well because uh, I didn't want to go into too much detail on it. Um, and there's lots of small numerical, uh, non very important details involved. Um, what we can do in the amortized case, uh, where we cannot do both kind of updates, is really we just roll back the program to its initial state and the time complexity of rolling it back a program after some calculations should be proportional to the time complexity of rolling it forward. And we get essentially the exact same back. Uh, I hope this was not too high level, but this is a small section in a paper if uh, the web band people are interested. Yeah. Right. Um, so there are some byproducts I would very quickly like to mention of our technique. Uh, you can, we can, you can find some low recourse online algorithms for LPs, uh, in a straightforward manner. Um, so in the online setting, constraints arrive in an online fashion, and we assume that variables may only increase over time or move in one specific direction. So essentially, they're partially dynamic. And they're very interesting log and approximate solutions um, with no recourse involved. But what if you allow for a very small number of, well, for as, not very small, but as small number of reduction steps as you can, and if you just allow for a small number of reduction steps per variable, by small again, I mean some uh, polylog over epsilon, uh, poly epsilon factor, then you can uh, maintain a one plus epsilon competitive uh, solution. And this really just straight up applying uh, our restricting LP solvers to the online setting. As I said, in these restricting algorithms, you can think of any restricting update as like an arrival of a new new constraint. So this is why it extends in uh, like with no effort. And you can also uh, model these algorithms as a streaming algorithm. Uh, streaming algorithm, LPs in streaming have not been studied as extensively as in other models, um, but you can create you can derive some interesting results. If you look at it this way, if the rows are arriving, we just need a uh, one over epsilon cube times polylog n number of passes to complete these uh, calculations in optimal space. If columns are arriving in the stream, then we need slightly more space and the same number of rows, the same, uh, same number of passes. But these are instantaneous applications uh, of, again, of the whole framework. Right. So I would just try to highlight what problems are we interested in after solving this, uh, whether the framework has further applications that would be interesting to know. Um, we didn't get restricting mixed packing covering LPs, but we do believe that there should be very much possible. Um, as I said, the dual of a mixed packing covering LP is not a mixed packing covering LP, or, but it's not the set of mixed packing covering LPs, so we cannot really just abuse that we are maintaining a dual solution. Our epsilon and polylog, but polylog complexity probably doesn't leave a huge room for improvement, but the epsilon complexity does because there's quite a lot of work in getting these LP solvers down to one over epsilon. It would be interesting to see whether it can be done in dynamic sense. 
Um, and while fluid dynamization for general RP is based on a lower band is impossible, uh, in a non-trivial fashion, for specific RPs, there have already been solutions, essentially, uh, even for the individual cases. And it would be interesting to see if you have specific RP solvers, say, restricted on width or a number of variables or something, which remain fully dynamic. That would be very interesting. Oh, yeah, there's... Uh, well, there's a lot of references. I'm happy to send this uh, uh, presentation around if people want to look at this. But I think this was me, right? I'm happy to take questions if there aren't any. If there are any. Thanks a lot, Dieter, for the talk. And uh, you can post questions, and I can just read them. There are some applause. I feel like the, the if you are not in the dynamic world, this duality between the two RP algorithms is an interesting little tidbit. In fact, when we first we spent quite a lot of time getting the relaxing versions, and when we didn't have the restricting one, and then we spent a lot of time getting the restricting version, we had a lot of complicated write-ups, and then we realized that both of them maintain a solution to the other one in a trivial manner. And that was kind of painful to realize because <laughs> we spent a lot of time on that. Is the solution that you're maintaining is, is the runtime competitive with, with what you have uh, in these this, uh, these special case LPs that you're solving for B part chain, for example? Um, or so is it far away in terms of log factors and, and so on. That is an excellent question. I think by log factors we are not far off, but the epsilon factor we might be. And that's mainly because we are running these, like, running these uh, iterations in parallel. I suspect that can be avoided somehow. Uh, as I said, it wasn't really our focus. There's so much work on these solvers which get down epsilon complexity. In the dynamic world, as far as I could tell, people are more interested in the log factors and uh, than the epsilon factors, whereas in the LP world, the epsilon factors gain more popularity. I wouldn't be surprised if this gets down to epsilon square, but I would be surprised if it gets down to epsilon, but would be very interested to see. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Um, I can see no other questions, so I think uh, we can just leave it at that maybe, and uh, if there's more questions, we can ask them in the lounge if we see you there, Peter. Uh, depends. I, I guess you will have to catch a train soon. Oh yeah, sorry about that. I did not realize that there is something after. I... No, no, that's that's fine. But for all the others, we can uh, socialize in the, in the lunch now. And I think uh, that closes the talk. Thanks a lot, Peter. Well, thank you for having me. And if people are interested in the presentation PDF or the actual, the publication is online, but I can put this PDF as well. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot.